Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Johnny Mattimore. I'm head of um, global risk and sustainable finance at First Derivative. And today I shall be um, chairing a discussion, a very relaxed fireside discussion, um, with four of my esteemed colleagues. Um, we're going to be discussing EBA Pillar 3, which is all about how do you calculate carbon emissions for bank portfolios. Uh, it sounds easy. Uh, I think we're going to discover it's really, really hard. <laughs> so um, I'd like to introduce first Richard Gary from one of um, the technology partners um, here in Ireland that are looking at solving uh, elements of this problem. He's with a company called Gamma. Uh, also um, next to it, Richard is uh, Damien Pigeon, who's solving this problem at Bank of Ireland. And next to me is Brian O'Kelly, solving this problem at AIB. And on my right is Vince Lucy, who is a partner at um, Solidatus, which is a specialty company in solving data lineage, data visualization, and is an excellent tool for um, solving some of these problems. So what I'll do, I'll hand over first to the banks. And Damien and Brian, can you tell us how horrible and how difficult is this problem? Thanks, Johnny, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I think ultimately uh, Pillar 3 EBA reporting is critical for banks, and you know, that's why when we talk about Pillar 3, it's, um, it's a regulatory requirement, and that really just reflects the fact that banks are seen as agents of change in terms of driving this agenda, but also you know, critical for their investors and other stakeholders is giving a view as to how banks are managing it. So just before we kind of get into it, like we kind of said, that, you know, even to give a bit of background as to what this Pillar 3 piece is, um, Pillar 3 disclosures are really around uh, a regulatory framework to ensure that banks have the capital to manage these risks and mitigate them, have the infrastructural frameworks there to manage the, the portfolios, as you mentioned, and then the infrastructure around reporting them. Um, and that's what Pillar 3 is really about. It's a capital adequacy framework for disclosures around the risks in our balance sheet. Um, so when we think about that, there's, a, there's another three things we think about in terms of these new Pillar 3 disclosures that are coming into play for, for all banks in the European area. And it's around what are they trying to tell stakeholders? And they're really trying to tell stakeholders three things. Uh, first thing is how we're managing those risks. And that's very much a, a written disclosure, you know, words and, and content in that regard. The second thing is how exposed we are to those risks. So it, the templates that we all have to populate are showing information in terms of the physical risk. So that's information around um, our properties and our balance sheets more exposed to flood risk. Is there wildfire dangers there as well? And we're seeing that happening now in, in real life in Europe. And that's having an impact on balance sheets and, and banks' portfolios. And then the third uh, related to that is transition risk. So we hear a lot about stranded assets. Um, the things we talk about when we look at transition risk is, are things going to be at risk in terms of their asset value when you move from the carbon-based economy to a green uh, climate-based or carbon-less economy? So that's, that's the second element of it. And then the third one is around um, what are we doing about it? So if you think about uh, what we are doing collectively as an industry in terms of sustainable finance, we have to show what we're doing in terms of turning the, the mix of our assets from what we see today in terms of the current economy into what's driving the green economy and leading that transition. So there are the three things we need to think about. And then the last thing for me in terms of three things is uh, around data. So when we look at all this stuff together, we've got data that goes into the pot, and that's data we already have in terms of our bank's portfolios and our balance sheet. Uh, data that we don't have, like things like that flood risk and, and wildfire information. And that's where Richard and, and his colleagues and so on in the, in the data industry can, can add to the, the mix here. And then the third thing is around data that we need to get from our customers. And that's a discussion that we need to have in terms of um, bringing that information into the bank, but also having that discussion with our customers around the sustainable finance piece. So there are my three things anyway. I was going to hand over to Brian to kind of give a sense of when we think about the data elements of it, what are we thinking about and how do we kind of you know, break this challenge down into things that we can activate and, and move forward. Uh, thanks, Damien. Thanks, thanks for your time. Um, I suppose from, from our perspective, we're, we're very conscious of, of the, the, the trajectory over the next three or four years and, and how the information ask is going to get more and more onerous. So to start off with, um, I think the, the EBA are being kind to us in some, some regards around the, the requirements. Um, 
to, to set up an infrastructure that's aligned to the existing financial um, regulatory reporting. So the FinRep, um, FinREP suite of, of, of disclosures. So, um, so, so in, in, in our approach to, to solving this, we've, we've taken a subset of, of FinREP and we've created a, a data, uh, database within our own infrastructure that, that holds that information at an account level and, and an asset level. So now it's about, um, it's about supplementing that asset and also that borrower level information um, with the aspects that, that Pillar 3 is go are going to focus on, which is uh, the greenhouse gas emissions at a counterparty level, um, the suitability of the, of the counterparty for um, NFRD. So, so that's focusing on the, the companies that have over 500 employees, so the, so, so the, the larger corporate uh, lending deals. And then on the, the physical location of, of the asset um, and, and its, its susceptibility to, to, to climate risk and physical risk. Um, so, so there's a there's, there's a start off phase where we're we're building that that understanding of our data, um, but there's also then some some big questions being asked uh, from the banks as to what um, our view is on, on a geography. So, so the EBA has left us uh, fairly fairly light in terms of definition around um, some of the concepts. So, um, so we have a, we have a concept introduce of uh, exposure to. To climate risk, and there's the term sense, sensitive to, to climate risk, but but no real definition. So, yeah. so as a as an industry, um, it's it's important that uh, we have the right information available to us and have the right uh, assurance of, of that calls uh, to 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 put together a, a coherent and uh, accurate uh, de description of what we feel the the risk is within Ireland and the geographies that we lend to primarily. It's interesting, you're, you're all using the word risk really quite significantly all the time. It's, if you look at how the evolution of sustainable finance, ESG, climate risk, etc. has evolved, there's a lot of activity going on where people aren't looking at the repricing of assets. They're talking about the image of an organisation, etc. I mean, what we're talking about here is the repricing of assets and making sure over time we can we can price them accurately with this new new data. Is that is that a fair evaluation of how important this is? This new data is going to lead to new valuation approaches. Yeah, well, look, I, I, I could take that. I, I suppose like. You, I have a background in risk, so I, you know that's that's something I, I certainly see as an aspect to it. But when I stand back from it, like our, you know, we talk about bank portfolios, like Bank of Ireland's portfolios, largely, um, seventy percent is property and car finance. So if you stand back from that, um, the risk there is around the energy efficiency of of both of those physical assets. So we would mitigate that risk by helping our customers with their transition, by making their properties more efficient, their businesses more efficient. Um, and you know that's something that you know banks um, need to do in terms of ensuring that the capital is invested on a go-forward basis in those sustainable practices, and that's really mitigating the risk to the bank's balance sheet, but also to the you know the broader society and economic piece. And I think pricing is just one aspect of that. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's part of how we you know how we engage with our customers, and we see in multiple you know pricing is always going to be a feature of always of, of any. Um, interaction you have in terms of banking but it's certainly something we've seen in terms of green mortgages um, this year like it, it's it's become a bigger and bigger uh, component of our mortgage um, origination it's it's almost over 50 percent now for the half year and we'd expect that momentum um, to reflect what we're seeing in, in in broader society as well and in terms of the timing how, how much pressure is there from a regulation like EBA Pillar 3 versus timetables for previous regulations? Is this more onerous or less onerous in terms of the compression of the time you have to actually meet these requirements? Um, uh, the, the climate stress testing was probably a, a, an interesting one uh, from our pr perspective in, in, in terms of regulatory expectation. Um, the, the, so the EBA would have given uh, you know, f quite stringent uh, and, and uh, robust stress testing uh, requirements to, to the banks and you know, limited enough time, to be honest with you, to, to deal with it. Um, but but the, the, there's, an ex there's an acknowledgement that it's a novel exercise. So um, that, 
that spirit of, of cooperation is probably more evident in this regulatory uh, um, engagement than it would be in other engagements where the expectation, although very, very, very high, um, there is an acknowledgement that, that it is quite challenging. So where, where one bank has a best practice or one supplier of, of data or one technology provider is doing something really, really well, there is a uh, there's good good cooperation and good engagement uh, back into the banks to kind of outline you, you know what 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 is good practice in this area and how yeah. how we you know we as an industry can can move towards adoption of those best practices to to bring forward the whole agenda um, of transitioning to a lower carbon economy. So in that respect, it's 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 a very helpful engagement. Um, in, in terms of onerous, in, it is onerous in terms of its its requirements, but yeah. um, the the objective is is probably you know it, it is time. It, there's no there's no ability for it to move in time, so yeah. um, it's 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 fair in that regard. And and if we look at how we've solved problems in the past, uh, a lot of financial organisations have looked inwards and tried to solve problems themselves. Um, how, how important has it been for you to look at collaborating? with um, partners, in particular fintech partners, of which we have two here today in Solidatus and, uh, and Gamma. Uh, how central has that been um, this time around versus uh, other regulations? Yeah, I can take that one and look at it. And I think um, there's a piece here just building on Brian's last point about timelines. Um, for this pillar three, it's recognized that it's a phase in and there's going to be a best efforts element to that. And that's not something we've seen in regulatory reporting before. And it reflects you know, the, the urgency that's really being put on this um, in terms of this specific topic that I think everyone shares. Um, and that in mind as well, you, know, you have to look out in terms of you know, where is the expertise in terms of um, particularly some of the data that's there and the, and the science that's there. Um, so there's a huge amount of collaboration across the industry in terms of um, the likes of the UN, uh, bringing banks together and cooperating in terms of methodologies, and then also you know the, the colleagues in the in, in the floor here as well in terms of what they're seeing and what they can bring to it. Because um, certainly from a bank's perspective, you know the science is there. We we want to ensure that we're lining up with the best science that's out there, and aligning our businesses and our portfolio actions to take that into account. So certainly when we look at that, we we think about data external sources as something we would we would look to partner with um, rather than try and you know build our own that's that doesn't make sense commercially or from a from a you know a science basis as well mm. Brian anything to add to that is pertinent to this age of collaboration <laughs> that we keep keep talking about yeah um, the consistent view is pretty is, is, is fairly central as well um, from my perspective from my thinking on it um, if I look at if you look at items like geography, it it's 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 a fairly you know tangible uh, uh, area to be talking about. So th that one one view, one bank uh, in operating in one geography can have one view of it and, a, and a, another and another. It, it it isn't really feasible really, uh, or a plausible scenario. Double and eight moving. It it is what it is, <laughs> um, and and it you know from a national perspective, it's a it's a it's important that, it, it, that we, we do have a common understanding so, and a common view. So that, that commonality of the view is probably the first step. Um, so the definitions of, 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 although this is a data and it's regulatory and, uh, and, and uh, so it is a data-led exercise, but the, you know, before the data becomes the definition and, and it's collaborating at a national level around understanding uh, and being clear about what the parameters are, 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 are key aspects of that. Um, and also, yes, yeah, the, the, the complexity of it, I mean, so, so Damien, talk, we talked through BER estimation um, in the absence of having a, a, a BER cert for all of our properties. Uh, that's probably the, you know, the first step of, of trying to understand the energy footprint of, um, and the transition need of our customers from a building perspective. Um, as that as it becomes more and more advanced, we, we probably need to uh, you know, have have access to the the, the best minds and the best in, information, and and the banks wouldn't be um, the natural you know 
um, the, the, our role in, in, in the problem is to, is to provide the finance, you know? So, that, so that's probably a perfect point to turn to one of the um, important fintech partners here, which is Gamma uh, and Richard. And you know, we're alluding here to data gaps uh, as, as well as the hard data that we do have. Could you explain around property portfolios the, the type of problems banks are looking to solve that you, you help them with, and in particular, how you address data gaps. Yeah, uh, thanks, Johnny. So I suppose Gamma's background, is, there's a few words have been thrown around here today. We've got property, risk, and geography, and that's really everything that Gamma does. We're a, a spatial intelligence uh, company that brings together data from third parties uh, data we gather ourselves to help answer some of these questions. So we would have worked with um, the insurance sector for, for years, and that's exactly the problem that they have in terms of underwriting. So understanding what are the risks associated with a property. Um, and, and that's what we've been doing for probably the last 10 to 12 years, is helping them to solve those problems. Identify where the risk is is, is a very important thing, so that's the geography element. Um, what type of property is it? Where is that property? And then understand what's happening either in it in terms of risk profile or around it. So um, a property sits somewhere, there's probably a, well, there is a, a flood, a potential flood element, uh, a flood risk element to that property. Um, wildfire was mentioned, that's pretty new to Ireland, although last summer where there was a lot of wildfires. So that's something new that we're gonna to have to start looking at. And then there's lots of other perils out there that are of interest to the insurance sector, which I'm assuming will probably become more of interest uh, in the future to the financial services sector. So we tie all that data together and help them to look at that. Now, I've only talked about flooding at the moment, but obviously understanding what's happening in the property as well from, a, um, I suppose, an energy efficiency perspective and tagging that with uh, a BEO rating in Ireland or an EPC rating in the UK is important as well, and we can help with that as well. So, so to be clear, the, the bear um, and the energy rating, we're, we're using that as a proxy for effectively the efficiency of the building. It can be used as a proxy for um, carbon emissions, use of capital, composition of a bank book. But we're, we're not just talking about brand new data like that. We're also talking about better quality geolocation data, physical risk data. So it seems that now there's more and more availability of that type of data. Banks are looking to ingest that more. Is that fair? And that adds to your data model and your, um, your enterprise model complexity. Uh, it doesn't mean the banks weren't managing these risks before. We've got to make that very clear. Um, it's just the sophistication now and what the regulation is asking you to do is much more sophisticated. Is that fair? Yeah, look, I, I think that's a, a good summation. It's not, it's not traditional balance sheet information. It's, it's yeah. new information that we need to essentially stitch in to the, you know, the accounting metrics that, that are you know, core in terms of how we think about it. Uh, finance and risk reporting. So as you think about that, you, you know, the information we, we generally have on a mortgage would be, you know, the exposure, the loan to value and, and so on. Now we need to think about some of the information that Richard has mentioned and think about it in, in, the, in, the, same, um, in the same data structure as you mentioned, John. And, and is some of that information coming from much more sophisticated techniques, especially for the, for the data gaps? We're we looking at robotic techniques for um, robotic surveyors. We're we also looking at machine learning to actually infer what could be the right type of data to use as a proxy for the gap. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there are historically some very good models out there, especially in flooding. Um, it's, it's a risk that's been known about for a number of years. Um, I suppose what's new in the flood risk um, space is it's always been looked at as more of a what's happened in the past. So now with climate change, we have to start looking at, well, what's happening in the future or what's potentially going to happen under different scenarios or different timeframes. So that's where your machine learning and AI comes in because we're, we have to try and fill those gaps in the, in the future. I mean, you've touched on a point which a lot of traditional risk engineering and science is based on historical data. Well, if we're actually moving into a period where the climate risk um, uh, exposures haven't been realized before. We're actually looking at potential synthesis 
of data rather than being able to look back at a historical sample set. Uh, are people already grappling with that idea of how do they create synthetic future scenarios, given that we don't have much on the historical scenarios? Um, I, I, I take that one. So I think for, for our work in, in um, setting science-based targets, um, it has been, has been interesting uh, from an organizational perspective on the time, time horizon on which we're looking forward. So our traditional uh, financial planning is on a three-year three -year basis, um, whereas for science-based targets, there's a requirement to, to look out to, to uh, 2050. Um, so the, the, yeah, the, I, there, there is definitely um, a, a, a recognition of the need for forecasting, increased accuracy of forecasting, and um, the, the looking beyond three years isn't enough. So when, when we move towards uh, move past three years, it does start looking a bit finger in the air, uh, unless we're bringing more, more rigor to that. I'd like at this point, we've, we've talked a lot about different data sets, and, um, and one of the things we've encountered a lot, all of us, is how to actually connect those data sets and how to connect data definitions back to principles. Um, I'd like to bring in Solidatus at this point, you, Vince. Um, the interesting thing about solving these problems is often knitting together many, many different components and many different regulations and many different banking systems. Um, you can't really do that unless you've got a way both to visualize it for humans, but also having very robust underlying taxonomies that you can map. It's, it's one of the reasons we've been looking to your firm to help us solve that particular problem. Could you describe a little bit about how, you've, how that's relevant to the whole banking and financial system market? So, so data lineage is a, a, a well-known approach these days to map data and or processes and or people through organizations. Um, and what we do at Solid Artists is we combine the business and the technical side. So you can, for example, take the hard text of the regulation, map that into your company definitions or ver verbiage that people are used to through your internal systems and then to the output that you require, but do it in a way that you can visualize it because these things get very complicated very quickly. As, uh, as Damien was saying about mortgages, you've probably doubled, if not more, the amount of detail you needed on a mortgage which means you now need a lot more people internally to understand what you're doing to know, to know that it's right, because it's getting more and more complicated all the time. So the ability to visualize that flow and share it across your organization means that you can be much more confident that not only do you know you've got a complicated ask, but you've got a sophisticated and demonstrable answer. Okay. And, and linking systems together. Um, for both the assurance, the evidence, uh, but more importantly, if you make a change, I mean, one of the things I've always encountered working in banking is if you make a change somewhere, you often have no idea what the implication is elsewhere, uh, and tracing that is extremely complicated. Um, are, there, are there elements in what you're doing around EBA Pillar 3 where you think there needs to be more people in the organization involved? Or are you at stage at the moment where you think you can do just a few mappings, a few systems, and the reporting itself can be relatively tightly contained at this juncture? Yeah, well, I think it goes back to something Brian said, that um, the regulation is quite helpful in this regard. You know, like if we, if we stood back from it um, over the last few years, there's been a number of, you know, um, drivers of change in terms of this. There's a task force for climate disclosures. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lot happening in terms of UN um, principles for responsible banking, but they're all focusing on the same thing that we've touched on, mm -hmm. which is use the core information that you always report on and add to it. Augment, yeah. so, not replace. Yeah, so from a data perspective, that allows you to kind of simplify this all down and say, well, actually, I'm just adding new columns to a big spreadsheet. Yeah. So, you know, in that regard, like the key thing it allows us to do is like we get this work done, we, we build these infrastructure points where we can bring in this new information to, to, to add to our understanding of the issue and the challenge. And then once that's in play, we can start to use that to help, you know, inform that customer. 
It's interesting, you're, you're talking about a regulation for reporting, but actually, in everything you're all saying, is that data is also being reused in the business. Is, is, could this be one of the first regulations where actually the data we create is monetized into the lines of business, into the group functions? So it's not just a sunk cost in reporting on data. It seems clear that this data is going to be instrumental in how you design your future operating model, the type of business you want to do. I, I, I think that's the general sense that there's a number of use cases for that information. You know, so reporting is one of them. But as, as we mentioned earlier, you know, one of the things we need to report on is how much capital and finance banks are, are providing into the green economy. Mm -hmm. you know, that way. So like ultimately, that's something that allows everyone, um, all stakeholders in this, to have full transparency in terms of what's involved. So yeah, if you think about data in terms of a strategy, it has to be data driven. It's, it's probably an unusual one as well. We should, the government have targets that are pretty much aligned to, to the bank's targets, not just from an economic perspective, but, but the carbon, carbon budget, yeah. um, but by sector. Um, the, 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 the green transition, the huge green transition, the green deal, fair, fair green deal. So, the, so with European support, global support, uh, national support, and then the role of the banks at, at, at a domestic level, um, all with, with, with the same objective, all with the same targets, all uh, trying to, 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 to shift activity to the right, um, to the right areas. So um, I think that, that sense of, um, of team or collaboration is, uh, is, is, is very helpful. So you feel like, yeah, yeah. There's definitely the one where you probably feel like you, were, yeah, you weren't on your own the most yeah. anyway, that's for sure, yeah. And, and are there any things, completely throwing it open to the floor now, We've, we've talked about quite specific things. Are there any general things you'd like to introduce around EBA Pillar 3 um, from your own experience of trying to solve these problems? Are there any particular personal um, viewpoints or any particular perspectives you have on what's the direction of travel here? What are going to be the big challenges? How important is it that the banks actually work together to solve these problems? For me, I need to kick it off. I think the biggest thing I can see in terms of this is like we're we're familiar with this type of reporting and you know pillar three and EBA and all that. That's that's kind of part of the the industry we have. Um, but when we see when we see the requirements for disclosures around emissions, like that's a new challenge, not just for banks but for the companies that that make up banks' portfolios, you know, mm. and. Um, EBA Pillar 3 is part of a broader sweep of regulation that's bringing disclosures right across sectors um, on, on things like emissions. So I think for me, that's, that's probably the biggest um, takeaway I have at the moment, is just the fact that like, this is something that not just the banking industry is collectively upskilling on and you know, the, there's always new regulation coming into banking, but it's something that all industries yeah. have to upskill on. And ultimately, we're, we're, we are aggregating information that other companies are going to have to report on. So things like data lineage become really important because how do we ensure that the data we are, are aggregating is accurate? Yeah. Um, so that's, that, that, that's the biggest piece I see that, that's really And how, that's really are, how are banks today going out to those, those clients? How, how are they digitizing that process to capture the data at source with confidence of, of the assurity of that data? I think, I think there's two things that I'll, I'll open up to colleagues now and this as well, but it's, this is a step in on, on the basis of that. Uh, there's two ways we can look at it. Like we, can, we can look at partnerships with, with companies like Gamma and Solidatus that are bringing that together at, you know, at scale, um, or then you need to look at it through your engagements with customers, and that's really around the, the upskilling for everyone involved in this. So it's certainly something that corporate, co you know, the corporate uh, community are highly engaged on and it means you know it, it has to be part and parcel of every customer engagement as we go forward so that's that's the piece about the kind of the phasing in of this this is just one strand of a much bigger change for for our industry and other industries as well um, I, I suppose we have to be very conscious as well about the asks that we place on on, on businesses and small businesses especially where whereby their their main purpose is to to 
serve their communities and, and look after their customers and look after their employees. And um, the, the last thing that, you know, that we want to, to, to do is to place a, a, high, a high degree of data um, data asks on, on, on those customers. So anything that, that the banks can do, um, any information that we can get, uh, either externally or internally, anything that makes it easier for those firms to get on and do what they're, they're supposed to be doing without having to, you know, um, provide a, a huge amount of documentation that, that creates, a, a, you know, friction for them um, is, is, is something that, that is, is probably probably more core to the, to the regulations, but, but you know, it, it, it's, it's definitely number one on our agenda as to how to make sure it's as, as painless as possible for, for our customers. Um, and if you were giving advice to anybody going on this same journey, um, what, 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 what would your main advice be around things such as partnerships? The second one would be around what other regulations do they really need to know, like the EU taxonomy and industry um, structures? And finally, what other regulations do you anticipate coming down the road thematically that would actually be a natural extension of carbon emissions? So the first one, more partners. Second one, um, um, the, uh, the, the way in which other regulations you're dependent on understanding more than just EBA. And the third one, what else is coming down the road? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good way of framing the, the, the challenge, Johnny, because I think uh, the, the it's old, a nice avalanche, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, no, like this, like this is, there's maybe start with that piece. Like this is just the start of it in terms of sustainability reporting for banks. Anyway. So you, climate will be the first one. Then you've got, um, you've got a nature lens on it, a biodiversity, and then the circular economy. So that's already indented in terms of European outlook on this. So um, we certainly are thinking about it that way and saying, Almost that you're 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 completing chapters on a, on a book that's still being written. But you know, if you if you look at it that way, we have to build this out. And and the, just linking back to your first question, yeah, you, you have to do this in stages. You know that way. So if you learn the first piece, it helps you do the second piece a little bit better. So you know, do your your long division, and then you can go up your or your multiplication tables, and you you can start getting into into harder sums as you go. That sounds like it's fifteen years of education ahead for us. But no, it is. I think it comes back into even to make it real. Like if you look at what Richard's yeah. doing, like that's all about about um, maps. And even if you think of Google Maps, you can look at it on a on a flood basis. We may not need to look at it on a biodiversity basis in time and so on. So layers again, layers. Exactly, and that's where the partnership piece comes in, that you can, you can have that core structure and then add those layers as you go. Yeah, that's, that's probably where we can help. Um, we've, we've talked about the regulatory reporting up to this point. Um, we can look at your, your book at a moment in time and report on that. But I suppose going forward, business as usual, we can provide the, the web services that can be hooked into so that uh, you're making decisions with data uh, that's live at this moment in time, but then it's clean, it's coming through into your database. So the next time you have to report, which I'm assuming is quite regularly, and there'll be more to report on, then the data is already there and, and ready to be used, whether that's through web services or even within a, uh, a peril finder, which is our tool that allows you to visualize risk and overlay not just flood risk, but environmental areas are um, our fire risk, our uh, subsidence, for instance, would, could be uh, a hot topic with the, the drying out of certain areas. I think there's a really good point Damien raised around, you know, there's a lot of data in banks now and they manage it. They know what, they're in control of it. They've done it for years. But there's going to be a whole lot of new data coming that they don't really have that background in. They don't have a culture to understand whether it's right or not. And the regulators are going to learn as they start getting reports that these things need to change. And the providers are going to change as they get more sophisticated. And, and you know, where would you go to get good biodiversity data? Right? It's a really hard thing. So, and this is, not, as, as we said, this is not the only thing coming. So, you know, for me, one of the key things here is we're going to have to be getting better at managing changing data more often and more frequently and we're going to need to be more transparent about it. So where we do use a model, because there isn't a sense, you know, if you go to a small corporate and they don't have the data, you're going to have to use a proxy or a model. 
and knowing when you're doing that and that transparency of how you're managing your obligation is going to become in increasingly important over time. That's probably a good point to go to the audience then. So we think this is going to run for a long time. The obligations are coming thick and fast and we need to be really flexible and really agile. And there are going to be very different data sets. So let's throw it open to the audience. Um, do we have any questions around any or other themes? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Taylor. I'm a consultant with First Derivative. Um, this is probably one for the bank, so I was just interested to understand a bit more uh, with re relation to the approach to um, the green asset ratio, so a new requirement under the EBA Pillar 3 uh, measures. Um, would it be possible to share at all um, the approach to categorization of uh, assets um, qualifying under the EU taxonomy regulation? and uh, maybe share some of the challenges they see in, in future in terms of calculating alignment to the uh, EU sustainability objectives. Wow, what a cracking question. <laughs> Who do you work for? <clears throat> that's, a, yeah, that's a nice, easy question. Um, the, the, so so last, last year would have been the first year that uh, we, the, 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 the banks would have been required to put forward some information aligned to EU taxonomy. Um, it, the first, the first ask is around eligibility, and, and uh, so we've we've got uh, the populations of our book that are eligible uh, within the, the the numerator and denominator for the for the for the GAR to be um, to be ring fenced, and, and we've reported on those, and each bank has, has done that. Uh, coming up next will be um, alignment with with the, the the aspects of the EU taxonomy that are currently live. Um, the, yeah, it's, again, it's the onus, it's the level of onus on the customer um, to provide some of this detail uh, that enables us to classify the loans will be one of the biggest challenges. So how do we, how do we marry up an uh, external view of counterparties and have a, have a central view of, of those counterparties so that each bank isn't, or each entity isn't, uh, you know, hitting one or a group of customers a hundred times looking for information. Yeah. It's the, source, the store of that information and the, making it available for everyone to utilize um, it, it will make it most efficient for the, for, for the economy. So uh, that would be one of the, the challenges that, that technology can, can help us solve. And then on our own side then as well, then it's the, the classifications of the loan and then getting evidence around that uh, is, is a challenge. Um, again, technology solutions there, but um, that would be my own perspective on it, Damien. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you nailed it, Brian. And I, I, I just think the piece that's really important as well is that this is quite a new area for everyone. It's quite technical. And having, like, it, it's a discussion with a customer as well. So, like, they are under the same obligations over time um, under EU legislation to start reporting on this kind of material. So that, that conversation is going to be useful on both sides in terms of just bringing us all up the curve in terms of this. So technology and uh, you know having having the questions framed in a in a, in a user friendly way is going to be really important for us all as we move this on yeah language is going to be key yeah. here because the more you complex uh, more is complex people will find it utterly impenetrable yeah. and and that's not going to help yeah, yeah. Any, any other questions from the audience please if not i have one um, if we take Pillar 3 data and we're thinking of how to use it elsewhere in the business, um, where are the likely um, first places? Is it going to be risk teams, finance teams, or is it going to be right at the, the front end where business is being originated? Where would you prioritise the, the, the data? Would it be to make business decisions so that you can transition your book more effectively? Yeah, I'd look, I, I think it's everywhere. Um, I, like I'd say the most important one is, is portfolio alignment. You know, when we, we talk about this, uh, Brian mentioned earlier on about... Stake in the ground, you know the state of the portfolio and the target. Yeah, and like in terms of this, a number of banks are, are in the process of setting targets to decarbonize their portfolios. So these, this information that's coming into play is, is going to put numbers on that, and it'll just help in, in terms of those decisions, and that, that drives things from the top down then. You know, so on that basis, if you, if you broaden it for Ireland anyway, you know, you've got property, you've got transport, agri, energy infrastructure, 
Um, that's the carbon footprint of the country. You know, banks will be part of the of the journey in that one, and uh, and pillar three starts to kind of put numbers and all of that, and, and and help with the with the measurement of the journey and the process and the progress on it. Brian, yeah, I think I think you know the the the, the metrics are there, and and once once they're populated through, so once we get to the 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 more sophisticated elements of the green asset ratio, um, it it the rules of the game are are clear, you know. So if if you want to shift and support and, and, and drive activity in that area. Um, it, it, you know, the, the green asset ratio in itself, you know, it's not going to be a perfect measure. Um, it's focused more on the, the larger counterparties. Um, so, so supporting it, the, 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 the same ratio for, for smaller companies. So I think those, those two asset ratios combined probably give a, a, a truer representation of the real economy. Um, and yeah, so it, it's standardization of the rules, and, and if you want to, you know, improve in one area and, and support in the right area, you, the, the rules are laid out there for you. So yeah. this should drive policy, it should drive, uh, drive the transition to the, yeah. you know, that's the, it's kind of, it'll do what yeah. it's supposed to do. And, and Vince, you, you, you work with some of the biggest banks in the world at your firm. What are you seeing um, in, in, in this same vein about the, the future and how they're repurposing the data? Uh, I, th I think one of the key things is when you're talking, it's all about decarbonisation. One of the things I think people are really struggling with is how do we facilitate people becoming greener with an asset I probably don't want on my balance sheet? So how do we get, and it's the kind of the green bonds type approach, but how do we, you know, the, if the idea is that we try and decarbonise the planet, we have to get everyone getting better, not just, you know, banks investing in clean assets and having a you know, a rump of dirty assets and nobody... And there are lots of existing assets on the books. Yeah. You can't suddenly flip them. So how do you, uh, you incentivise oh. good behaviour in polluters? And I think that's one thing people are really struggling with. Which is back to the customer behaviour. How does a bank work with the customer to enable that transition to be more comfortable, which is back to language and, and, and back to customers possibly knowing their own risk exposure their own bear ratings, their own flood risk. Um, I mean, how, how much on the gamma side of the data that you provide is ultimately fed back to customers? Do, the, do you do that with banks? Do you take that data and do you also share it with customers of what your own profile is uh, of, a, of a mortgage, for example? Oh, sorry, that's to, that's to Damien and, and Brian about you, the data you've acquired um, using specialist providers like Gamma. Do you share that data back to the borrowers ever at this stage? Well, it's very early stages in, yeah. in terms of that, that type Could of Could you see a time where sharing that with a mortgage borrower to say, look, this is the perception we have of, of your property and we've got ideas of helping you improve the property risk? But I, I think if we think about something like retrofits, we, we, we already you know provide something like home improvement loans in, yeah. in, in terms of that. and. Um, and for SME businesses as well, and you know, if if I scale it up to something like corporates, um, sustainability link loans is just they're becoming a bigger and bigger feature. So you know, the engagement there is really around what are the what are the actions that those customers are are, are looking to take to uh, make their business more you know more sustainable and greener and so on. And when they hit those points, you know, th there are margin releases on that. So that's at a corporate level where you know that they have their own strategies and so on. That's becoming a bigger and bigger feature. So that 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 two-way um, dialogue in terms of information is there, you know. Um, but I think as the information becomes more available through P Pillar Three, it becomes more. It opens up more options. I, that's I expect. Okay. Well, look on the final comment. We'll wrap this up. EBA Pillar Three: A Road to the Future for Banks. Thank you very much, everybody.